Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to tonight's Quality of Life meeting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order at 5.31 p.m. And roll call, it looks like we are all here, which is great. Um, for everyone in the audience, just to make sure that we know who, who's who, um, Planning Commissioner uh, Vanessa Heyman, Councilman uh, Skip Gorman, Mayor Eric Bruin, and Planning Commissioner Megan Richter, and then our Parks and Rec Director, Nerissa Wagner, and our Parks and Rec Assistant Director, or the number two in charge, Jen. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> our scribe. I'll call you our scribe. Do I, is there a reason I have the timer? No. Just curious. <laughs> oh, this could be tragic, but we'll let it go. Okay, um, so is there any changes to the agenda as presented? Okay, hearing none. Is there any changes to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and move on to our public comment section. Is there any public comments on items not on the agenda? And I'll give you a hint. The agenda is a pool. <laughs> is there any public comments of items not on the agenda? Well, it sounds like we'll get right to it. So our one item of business for this t tonight is this is our second pool town hall. This is our continuing process of working the uh, input and communication towards the rebuilding of Sergeant Penny Pool. Again, we are looking to rebuild it into a great facility for our entire community, addressing your concerns and also getting your feedback. Our uh, consultants are here this evening. They are here once again to provide us some direction. Um, and I would like to invite um, Scott and I'm going to butcher the other name, and I can't remember. Dennis. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Scott and Dennis, come on up. They have microphones, and they are going to lead us in this discussion about where we have progressed since our last meeting. This is on. Let me try that one. Good evening. So, welcome all. Good to see some faces that we have saw the last time. Why don't we roll right into the first slide here to talk a little bit about what we started with. If you may recall, about a month ago, we all got together. There was a little bit of hands-on work here um, in trying to give us some guidance as the design team. Your preferences in terms of features that we wanted for the pool or pools, as well as for the pool community building that um, would accompany this. So you may recall we had boards up around the side. We had site plans. We took photographs of all that. Thank you very much for getting those back. And we got a lot of great feedback on what the community preferences were, and I think now is our opportunity to start to refine that into a series of building components and pool components, and we're gonna share that with you tonight. So, going to the next, what we're looking at, and we're using these pool pictures that aquatic design has brought to our attention to kind of give you an idea of, A, the size of the pools that we anticipate, um, and what they might look like. Just sort of give you a visual. And when we come back at the next meeting, we'll have those even more refined. But the main competition pool, and I'll, I'll lead it up to you, you can talk about each of the pool types and what their purposes are gonna be in, <coughs> in general, how they're gonna function. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> Again, thank you for having us here this evening. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, so from our last meeting, what we heard was coming up with an aquatic center with three pools or three bodies of water. <laughs> That means each one is in, operated independently. And in terms of the three, we have a standard swimming pool that could be used for swim meets, for water polo, for swim lessons, a whole variety of different programs. And we talked from diving to if somebody wanted to come in and rent it for scuba lessons to fitness classes, swim lessons, as we talked about before, swim meets, swim practice, water polo meets, um, all of those. 
And as we started talking about those programs as to what would fit into it, that starts to speak to the built environment on what we're going to need to support that. So a portion of that's going to have to have deep water for the diving board, which would be 12 feet deep for a one meter diving board, for example, where we're going to have competitive swim for safe diving off of the edge. Today's standard is the water has to be at least seven feet deep for that area of the pool. And then um, to meet California code, we'll have a shallow end that's going to be roughly three and a half feet deep with stairs. A pool this size would require that we're talking about uh, 6,000, square feet, somewhere in that neighborhood. It has to have at least two means of ADA accessibility. And so in that, we anticipate using a battery-operated lift that would allow people to get in and out, and then also transfer stairs as a secondary means of ADA accessibility. This would be the cooler water pool. We've envisioned this as being a pool that'll run roughly in the 78 to 81 or 82 degree water temperature. The second pool that we had talked about is the children's activity fun pool. And you can see we're showing some examples of whether it's beach entries or little mini lazy rivers or currents that we could get into it, interactive water play. And we start talking about how we're going to look at this facility to cater to people from two years of age to 102 years of age. And so how are we gonna create these areas and stations within that? And so the children's pool, based on the programs we're hearing, that's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of about a 3,000 square foot body of water. And given the young children that we get into it, for example, the, the, the image you see on the bottom right, it goes from a beach entry into that kind of lane area that could be used for swim lessons, for mommy or daddy and me classes and things like that. So because of that, this is expected to run probably in the 85 to 88 degree water temperature for a lot of its programs. And then we talked about a therapy pool, and that would be a pool that's gonna be about three lanes by 25 yards or so that would allow people to come in and do actual therapy, do rehab if we want. Um, it can still be used for fitness classes and lessons if we're not using it for those purposes. And so as we look at these different bodies of water, we're gonna talk about how we can lay them out so it can get all kinds of programs so that these things can be utilized, you know, virtually sun up to sun down anytime it's open. But the benefit of breaking this rather than in one big pool, and that's what we were showing you on the upper left picture, where you can see the, the, the lanes that wrap around into the other water, that then becomes one body of water that's one temperature. Um, and if we had to take it down for maintenance, we've lost the entire pool. So by breaking this into multiple pools, it's gonna give us a lot more flexibility. Also, we can reduce operating expenses. If, say, um, in the middle of the winter, perhaps the kids' activity pool isn't gonna be used, we don't have to heat that. So we could let that go somewhat dormant. We would, we would still chlorinate it and maintain the water temperature, but we can greatly reduce the operating expense um, in terms of how we're gonna operate this. So we got a lot of great feedback. We thank you from last, uh, the last meeting. If you have any comments or thoughts about what we're talking about here, we would love to hear it. And then as Scott mentioned, um, we're working now to develop these into actual drawings and show you some more details as to actually what these pools, some options as to what they can be. So, and I think one of the things we've kind of honed in on is about an eight lane competition pool with an extra um, warm up lane. At, that's how we got to the 6150 square feet. So it, it's roughly what you would typically see, a 25 yard competition pool, which will be uh, certainly for CI, CIF standards, et cetera, for swim meets, it'll all meet all those requirements. And then of course, that'll have the touch pads and the starting blocks and so forth. That can Scoreboard, be, all of that. Right, and then also places to um, uh, anchor things like um, uh, the goal nets for uh, uh, water, water polo. polo, et cetera. So. And if it's not being used for comp competition when it's in that deeper water, we might get the floating obstacle courses during rec time that the kids can play on and they're climbing over and racing along and stuff, but it's over deep water, so it's got the fall attenuation. So it's, a, it's an example of how we can take that, what we call flat competition water, and still get rec uses out of that as well. And you may recall we showed some some typical ideas of what could be done with that um, in our last. So we'll come back to that at a later date. Then moving on, we, we wanted to kind of start to look based on 
a couple of the sort of dominant ideas that came from your input at the last meeting. And really, if you look at this thing, and I don't know if this is going to work all that well because of the, the light, but if you look at the yellow and the sort of, I'll call it fuchsia colored elements there, that's sort of the, where we're seeing the, the main building components on the, I'll call it on the west or southwest side of the property. Why do we have it there? Well, for a couple of reasons. We also have a parking lot that's there. We'll probably redo that to some extent. But remember that the wind is coming predominantly from the southwest. So we want to use the building mass as a wind buffer. Secondarily, um, and this is just an early iteration of, of sort of the site analysis that we, we go through. Um, as we, we'll go to the later slide in just a moment, but we have a number of activities, both the intense pool areas, but also say passive areas like the play area that might come into fruition. Because at the end of the day, not everybody's gonna be in the water all the time. Uh, we want some outside areas for picnicking or you know, just some passive areas around that may not be concrete, um, but at the same time, it's enclosed in the space. And then you can see the sort of orange elements are where we might put uh, various solar arrays to offset some of the energy uh, uses that's going to happen here. And by the way, I know the city has already worked on putting an application in for solar arrays, so we'll see how that goes. But the idea is that it might be over parking areas. It might be also used for um, shading, um, uh, let's say, pedestrian or um, um, people that might be attending a, a swim meet, but they're not out in the open. We don't necessarily have to have all the pop-ups that come up with, like a soccer meet, if you've ever been out. Um, we're also looking at extending a, a wall, again, partly for security reasons, but also to support um, another roof structure that goes across the south side. So think of this as sort of a big wing that will be able to both shade that area on the inside with solar panels wrapping around over the building proper itself so that we have this sort of massive, I'll call it like a, almost like an aerodynamic wing that uh, gives us a lot of protection in that area. And then looking in this, this is just sort of, sort of the early diagrammatic types of things we do, but we need about 2,000 square feet just for the mechanical equipment, uh, the pumps, the filters, the heaters, and that doesn't include the covers and the lane markers and so forth, but we do have some storage for that. We need space for locker rooms and restrooms for changing. We'll have spaces, uh, some administrative office area for this, this community space, reception, you can sort of see us sort of progressing up there. And at the top end, we talked about concessions so that we'd have a snack bar or something like that. And also a rec room that could be rented out for parties. I call it the community room. If you recall, that was sort of a key feature that showed up time and time again. So something that could be used for meetings, it could be used for birthday parties, it could be used for any number of things. And obviously associated with the pool as well. And overall, we're looking at about 6,000 square feet at this time. And I think that kind of follows the original programming that you had from earlier discussions. All right, so let's go on. Oops, I we went too far. So the next thing we also looked at was general circulation. How do we get, you know, identify where the front door is? That's always a good thing to know where the front door is. How many times have you tried to walk around and find where do we enter the building? So from the south side, you can see that's sort of a major node at that corner. We also envision sort of a pedestrian access directly from the street. And as you can see, it sort of divides where the competition pool is, that larger light blue element, from the children's pool and therapy pools. So again, if you think about what Dennis was just saying about how maybe during the winter, uh, the competition pool stays in sort of full-time use, whereas maybe the children's pool or therapy pool might not be fully used during the winter. May or may not, but the idea is that we do have some separation there. And also, when you get into competitions, you do want to have a separation <laughs> from the children's pool um, to some extent. So we see that as sort of a, 
uh, pergola that goes down the center with maybe some covering there to kind of identify as, again, a front door from the street side. And I do think that there may be an idea to put a children's play area across the street. I think we talked about that at one point. Yes. So. Or on the other side of potentially the parking lot. Right. Yeah. So we're leaving that as sort of an identifier along with the appropriate safety precautions going across the street. I was going to say one of the other things that we did, and not to interrupt you, is that big space to the to the left is a variable space. It's a budget variable space. I just want to make sure the audience understands that one of the things that we're doing is we're laying out the important elements that we think we want to make sure we can accomplish within our budget while leaving space for us to be able to either do future expansion or be able to come back with, hey, we could do this too. So right. there's, there, there's a reason why there's some empty spaces specifically in the layout. Right. So like the northwest corner here yeah. is a good example of that space between the senior community center that we can put half basketball courts out there. We can do other things. It also allows us to look at that play uh, or the access from that side. We want to make sure that we have maybe access to the parking lot to the north for the community center for overflow parking for very large events. So that's why you see the sort of three arrows and sort of these kind of community, these nodal points uh, that we point out. And then on the right-hand side, this kind of gives you an idea of where we might put a series of, of shade and solar structures. So obviously a large part of the building, um, if you look at the bottom here, that sort of second wedge might have a, a wall that will come up fairly high to block the wind, and then a pitched roof that will uh, cantilever over that. And underneath that, that might be a place for the bleachers or uh, places for spectators to sit in a shaded area. Uh, but remember that they're sitting on the side of the pool lines, not at the front or the rear. We also have um, adequate space, I think, at the end of the pool, particularly when it's closest to the building, where starters, timers, all of the sort of things that happen with a uh, meet, typically you have a lot of people standing in that area. So we want to make sure we have about 20, 30 feet between the building and the edge of the pool as a minimum. So we kind of have to balance that out a little bit. And then we'll go to the next one. And this starts to show now the internal relationships of where that structure is. So obviously the pool equipment is down in the corner. That allows us access for bringing in the chemicals on a regular basis, servicing with a service road along the back. Um, to the right of that is sort of the check-in nodal point uh, that people can find from the parking lot to the south, concession stand, whatever, and we've since done a little bit of modification here. In the center are the locker rooms, restrooms, and showers. Uh, we have a kitchen, if you will, um, that would service both the indoor recreation or, or community room, and then have an outdoor rec space that could, again, expand maybe into that unknown space to the north, um, however we want to do that. But you can sort of see these elements of circulation and control that we want to have so that while this is an open space, particularly along the street, it'll be fenced, you, will, you want to have this high visibility from the building, from the parking lot, you know, as people enter, and also from the street so that from uh, a drive-by in the evening with police, they can see that, you know, although it's well lit, nobody's there, and off we go. So last but not least, just sort of giving you some ideas on these sort of tall roofs. And, these are recently built buildings, but if you can see the sort of tall wedge-shaped roofs, we thought this was sort of fun with the Newport Beach Civic Center that looks like waves. Um, kind of interesting. The, the, the one at the bottom is, I thought, interesting because it's, these are simple buildings in block, but notice that they have the glass way up high to allow you know a lot of light in, and this sort of extended overhang that would be exaggerated to give the shade that we're talking about. And then uh, we were also looking at sort of an area between the, the hard edge of the building, the, the concrete block that we might use, which is very durable, and sort of a big sort of 
hallway that is glass enclosed so that again you have maybe an indoor gathering area you know for inclement days but it's still very visible using glass <coughs> with maybe a frosted motif on there in in some sort of fashion that reflects you know the swimming and activities so that it all focuses in on the pools and um, creates this great deal of excitement but in a very simple clean um, uh, architectural way. I think that's the best way to describe it. So that's where we're at. Um, hopefully that starts to resonate a little bit with you, but we now would appreciate getting some feedback from our group up here, and I guess we'll ask the audience as well. Oh, no, we'd, have, we'd very much like participation again. We would love your, your thoughts, your observations. Um, we can talk up here, but we really want to hear from you guys. So um, things that you see, things that you may not think we've addressed, um, we'll, we'll take all inputs. A comment and a question. The, sure. co the comment is your, your, your wing to the comment you made. Be very careful of vortices and, dr and debris that catches in the corner and is a always to be cleaned out problem. And then I'm curious about any shade structures that might be over bleachers and whether they are in the picture or are people going to sit in the hot sun to watch them eat. So if I go back here, oops. Try to go back. Yeah. No, that's not quite what we want to talk about today. <laughs> we like them. They're good people. We even know some of the people in the audience, but we really don't want to talk about that. <laughs> As he's getting to that slide, yeah, we, we have do it, been Doc. talking Had about... To do it shade um, throughout there for the bleachers. We know that that's very important. And that, in fact, that was one of the, the hot buttons we had heard is you can never have enough, enough shade, shade or too much shade for these kinds of facilities. Let me go back here and I'll try to point it out to you. If you go to this point here, so you see this, we have a dotted line in a number of places that would be uh, places that would be in shade. And, and certainly we haven't shown where all of the solar arrays are included. Down here on this far right side, the sort of last piece right there, Dennis is getting to it. Imagine that, that roof line coming over and the bleachers sort of tucked in behind that with the wall behind that to block the wind, okay? And the idea is that there'll be some shade there, there'll probably be some shade, uh, obviously in this area there as the roof extends out. And then we haven't really shown them around the children's pool up top, but we, if you look, there'll probably be a solar array or something up there as well. Uh, but we're looking at all those surfaces as opportunities shade. to have shade. And the other thing that caught my, my question craw here is, if you have a large equipment or large uh, items, pool covers, uh, lane markers, and they have to be weaseled out from the equipment storage area, how do you get them out into the pool area? Well, we have the service road on the back side, but we may be putting a separate pool storage, uh, equipment storage. Other than that? the children's area. So, so we, we actually talked about that. Go ahead. Yeah, Scott and I had talked about this, and right now we had identified about 2,500 square feet of shade out there off of the deck, whether that's lane line reels, pool cover reels, lifeguard chairs, water polo goals, starting blocks. You know, we've got a whole uh, litany of those. And so what, one of the things we've talked about is we may come out with some areas knowing that trying to take pool covers off and then rolling it somewhere is not going to happen. So we need to come up, and that's why we identify early on the list of the equipment, and we'll be presenting that at the next meeting for you all to comment and say, hey, you forgot about this, or you know, we don't think we need that. Um, and then how it's going to be kept so that we can access it from all of the pools readily. I'm curious about the splash pad that we have over here. We're not repeating it again in the pool area, are we? No. We're not wasting money on that. Thank you. <laughs> It'll be a whole new splash pad. No. But, uh, but, but uh, you know, ma'am, ma can I just address real quickly? Um, the splash pad, when it started, even I was one of the biggest opponents against it. I can tell you we have seen the community's outreach for the splash pad be substantial. The community's 
impact and desire for the splash pad is far, far more than we may realize in our bubble of, of, of what we experience individually. And I have seen more kids out there than I could possibly have ever imagined out there, especially during the summer. Now, without a pool, that's a good reason for them to be there. Don't get me wrong. I've got four small children of my own. But we're actually planning to expand the splash pad. I just want to be just for the sake of conversation and awareness, I'll be happy to discuss it with you further. But we actually, one of our strategic plans is to make a slight expansion to the splash pad and including a playground area with it at Freedom Park in order to make the, it a conducive entire complex of areas. And I'll be happy to discuss that further if you'd like. This is not part of that, but this is not part of that. But I just want to make sure that I'd be happy to talk with and share and hear your opinions on I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kathy Penny Segovia, and Yay. my brother is jo Sergeant John Penny. And I just have to say, this is my heart. You know, we were so afraid that nothing was going to happen. And instead, it's fantastic. Most of you know the story about him sleeping next to the brewer pool, keeping that pump going so those kids could swim the next morning because the chemicals wouldn't be right if he didn't swim. So when he went to Vietnam, he said, please, please, if I don't make it back, have them buy a new pump for the pool. <laughs> so my parents, of course, you know, put that out, and, and that's how the pool came about. Also, my son, through John Penny Pool, got a full-ride scholarship to college through swimming. And so we give a lot of that to the pool and the fact that he was able to use that. So I just thank you all for your time, and, and God bless you. Your brother's memory will not be forgotten, and this will be returned to the community. I have a, I have a few questions. Um, when I looked over this, I saw the diving. Now, as I experienced, most schools and stuff are giving up diving. Uh, but my question is not that you're going to have that diving pool, but uh, is it movable? The diving board? Yeah, the diving board for the shallow one, the one meter, and then the, I guess it's 10 meters or maybe five, no, it, 10 it's feet. A, what's shown there right now arbitrarily is a one meter and a three meter. Three meter. From our last meeting, what we had discussed was probably one meter and not three meter. Oh, uh, that's, the high that's dive. what I'm referring to. Most the, schools are giving up the big Yeah, the, the three meter has nothing to do with schools anymore. So yes. a high school swim meet event, one meter diving is a swim meet event. Okay, but this and one would not be movable, right? They are movable. I oh. mean, it's there's eight bolts that hold this to the ground. So, yeah. you know, and it's going to take a couple eight of people, bolts, a couple hours bolts. to move it. But <laughs> um, it's it can be moved during certain times of the year. If we say we're, we're not diving anymore, let's get it out of the way. Yeah. That can be done. No, with I'm that just time. saying it was, it was a plain nuisance for officials to go around. Absolutely. The diving board. And, and that was something we talked about the last meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I had one more question, if I can remember what it was. My memory doesn't work like it used to. <clears throat> Lights. Where, where, are, where are you going to put something up for a loudspeaker or something of that nature so there's an announcer can announce to the people? Good question. So one of the things that we'll show in the next... Uh, Iteration is probably the scoreboard location. Typically, we have pole mounted um, speakers, weatherproof speakers around. Uh, and some of those poles might also have um, area lights to light the area. In addition, the pool will have lights in it as well for night uh, use. Yeah, yeah, we'll have underwater lights in the pool. In fact, we anticipate on the swimming pool to oversize those lights in that um, we also anticipate overhead lights so that we could have a nighttime swim meet if we chose. And so by the um, Illuminating Engineer Society, they tell us that to light a public pool like this, if we're lighting it for nighttime recreation use, you would light it up five to 10 foot candles. That's a level of, of lumens. And if we're gonna light it up for a nighttime swim meet, we would light it up to about 20 foot candles. And if we wanted to light it up for nighttime water polo where the balls are getting chucked around, then you'd light it up to 30-foot candles. Now, the brighter the light, the steeper we need the angle of incidence, or what happens is the light hits the water and creates glare, and then you can't see under the water. 
Now, the more light we put in underneath the water, the more we can negate that glare. So that's why we're gonna add extra light that makes it easier to make sure we don't have an issue with glare. And then as part of the design, as we develop this, we'll get into you know, what level of lights do we need to have. Fortunately, with the new LEDs, they can be aimed so they're targeted right at the spot without a bunch of spillover or anything. Um, and then they also have the ability to say, let's run it at 10 foot candles for this purpose, or if we wanted it 20 foot candles, we can turn it up. All of that will be designed and engineered as part of it. And I just had a comment. I just really pleased that you're thinking of the three settings, so you can have one operate year round, and the other ones, um, especially the little kid pool, can shut down perhaps seasonally. Or so I think that's really um, effective, wise, and stuff. So good job. Uh, I actually oh. go ahead, Brad. Oh, uh, my question is the depth. What are you for the competition pool? What are you yeah. anticipating for that? For the um, if we have one meter diving, then that's going to be a twelve foot deep area. Wherever we have the water polo field to play, and where we have starting block diving, that's seven feet of depth. And then we would transition to the shallow end area that would be three six. So you need to go from shallow deep to water polo. That's fine in high school. Correct. Well, no, we we can rather than going deep from end of lane to end of lane. Um, what we can do is do it sideways so that we can have a number of lanes that are basically six lanes that are all in seven foot or deeper, seven to 12 feet. That gives you a water polo 75 by 45 field to play all deep. So it's CIF and USA water polo compliant. On the ends of those lanes then, we would also have that set up so that it's, it's seven feet so it works for the starting blocks as well. And then we can transition for subsequent lanes to get ourselves out to that 3-6. Similar, yeah, yeah. Right, and it has an extra lane for warm-up, so that might be in the shallow end, uh, shallow end side of the, the uh, pool. So I had a, I had a question. Um, I, I'm a little confused about the access entry points with respect to admin, um, and I also wondered, since wrestling pool equipment is a pain in the tail, is, is there, would it, would it be simpler for maintenance purposes if your indoor outdoor rec spaces were swapped with the pool mechanical spaces? Uh, Just in terms of access for the, the for the pool? Put it up in that neck of the woods and then push everything out. So the, the rec area or the, the indoor rec area is pushed out a little bit further into that northwest corner. So maybe the best way to describe it. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Got it. So, to the extent that they're going to be on a large uh, roll-up element, they can roll anywhere. But okay. It would be nice if we didn't have to roll it back into the main building. Yes. And that's one of the things we were just talking about that we need to kind of refine that a little bit. Okay. Well, one of the things we envisioned was perhaps almost like a trash enclosure that even though we don't need to put it indoors, it's outdoor rated equipment, we also don't want it baking in the sun. Right. So, by coming up with some kind of a block wall or a screen fence so that you don't have to see it, depending on how people stacked it in there, with a roof or cover protection against the elements, but it's not part of the building itself. It's something, we, we would then in the building have some components that are indoor storage. So like touch pads for a timing system or a computer control for a swim meet. Those are things that have to be indoors. The rest of it could be an outdoor, but protected. Okay. My my second question is respect to access. So your your admin area guest check-in is all the way over at the bottom, but you have entry from the middle and from the far side. So are you going to have like a fence that keeps folks from, okay. So uh, good point. Certainly a, a gate or an entry point that is, you know, you can close off from the main parking lot to the south. You would have a gate from the street. That yes. Open. Okay. And then when you have a, let's say, a major event where you might want to use the 
parking lot up by the community uh, senior center, we would want to have a pathway for people coming from that direction. As well. But it would all route, like folks just can't go into any door they want. Everything routes to the admin building before you can check in? It depends on how you all want to. You all, you'll have to tell us what components. So like, let's say there's a uh, swim meet. Normally, you probably wouldn't go through the admin area. You might have, you know, I don't know what you'd sell tickets, but you would want your competitors to be able to get there. But your spectators might be parking in a number of different places. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it just depends on, from an administrative point of view, how you want to handle large crowd, you know, security and how you want to handle it. Sure. You, you probably need to give us a little feedback on that. Uh, for me personally, I don't have any experience in building buildings and hurting children and or adults in different yeah. spots. I just know I have concerns about, one, you know, in the summer you have teenagers who are checking people in and stuff, and you, you if you have an easy access, you have all these doors that are in theory accessible. Um, it would it would make sense to me to funnel everybody usually to that check-in spot, but then you could open up the fence for like different fences for, I guess, I, I just don't know if, if traffic funnels naturally to admin and then everybody can access this other stuff or if like from that middle sidewalk folks could just walk into the rec space. Well, and again, I think you, you having some flexibility to do that okay. is up to you all to give us some guidance. We thought maybe having the pedestrian access out to the street would be useful for, if, if as an example, we talked about a play structure that might be across the street. Well, and I think it's very safe if kids are getting dropped off so that they don't have to walk through a parking lot. Right. I, I think that's a really good idea. Right. So uh, uh, these you are the things feedback. we need okay. a little feedback on. And, and it's also an, a ability to be open but doesn't have to be open okay, and that's you. the kind of the, the other thing is, is it's a big difference between a gate that's closed locked but okay it's summer season we've got events going on in the park we want to have that gate open as an accessible point we could which is that if i if you don't mind we have two callers that have called in if you don't mind for me to switch and let them yeah. uh, go ahead can i have first caller go ahead oh they're gone oh, oh. Well, if caller, if you're out there on YouTube world, we, we tried to grab you. I do apologize. I was trying to get to you as quick as I could. If I may, Eric, uh, let me just jump in for a moment. Callers, uh, if, if indeed you want to participate, you have a question or a comment, the phone number, which we don't give out often enough, area code 760-499-5010. I'll say it one more time. Area code 760-499-5010. One zero. Also, the two gentlemen with the microphones, you having those microphones comes with an awesome responsibility. And that is when somebody asks off mic you a question, you've got to repeat that question before you give an answer. I don't know what I said before, so you'll have to prompt me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You don't have to remember. Hell, I don't. <laughs> so uh, going back to the comment about the remote storage area that we were talking about. One of the things that Dennis and I were also noting is that it might be prudent to have a second set of restrooms closer to the children's pool, okay, rather than pulling them all the way down. So if we build the structure with maybe some uh, secondary uh, restrooms, it allows the children to just dart into that space rather than trying to travel all the way yeah. back down. The other thing that we were looking at was, let's say we're in a winter situation and those pools children's pool, therapy pool, are not really in use. We might have a second round of, of fencing that just keeps everybody in the competition pool area uh, during the winter. So okay. we might have a secondary gating system in there that maybe uses that pergola that we talked about, the covered area that comes in from the street. So that, yes, everything will be fenced off, but a section of it, people won't wander over there, let's say. Um, if they're really not being used. So there, there's some, I think, advantages to having the remote storage and the restroom, and it kind of fills out that corner there when they are in use, that they're not having to run all the way back into the main building. Mm -hmm. and, and those restrooms might be like a family, you know, all gender or a family bathroom, so mom can take her son or dad could take a daughter in, something like that. Um, and then the idea that fencing also allows us to say, have a swim meet, but still have swim lessons or still have a, a aqua aerobics class, which would allow us to divide the spaces 
or even um, as Scott mentioned, if those pools are shut down by fencing them off, we don't have to lifeguard them. So we can reduce our staffing expense by being able to break that out. And, and the other thing in terms of the entrance, it is our intent to have a primary, for security sake, entrance into this. But for example, in the peak of the summer, we might have people trying to come in and sign up for lessons. And you got others that are already with the lessons when we're trying to funnel in you know, 30 or 50 kids every hour, families in and out. So sometimes we might open, you might staff a secondary location to let everybody that's already signed up and they're just coming in for their hour lesson or something. Or so, dropping people off. Yeah, you know, so on it's, the it's yeah. getting that flexibility and, and then figure out how we control it all. Okay, my last question, then I'm totally done for now, is <laughs> um, putting bleachers under solar panels, is that, has that been done before, or is usually the height of those solar panels too low for most bleacher setups? So what we envision is pretty high okay. roof structure. The other thing that we're looking at is making these portable bleachers so that they can be moved out of the way if we want. They don't, we don't envision football level, you know, stadium right. level no, things, of but not. you may want to take them out during the summer when you don't have an event and have that could be a place where families can gather, maybe you have some chaises or tables underneath there. Okay. You put benches or other stuff. Yeah, and right. typically the the bleachers that I'm thinking about can fold up yes. and roll out, you know, so that they can be manipulated. They're not bolted down. And they're maybe three or four levels tall. You know, we're not talking about seating thousands of people, but of maybe not. a couple hundred at best. Okay. At best. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we do have our caller back on the phone, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch over. Caller, go ahead. Hi, um, yes, I got a couple questions. Uh, first one was, I know that they are looking at CIF requirements. Are they also looking at USA swimming requirements to make sure that uh, it suits the needs of the other swim teams? Yes, we are. Okay, uh, the children's pool. A lot of times they're used for warm-ups and cool-downs for competitions where they wouldn't be able to do such in the competition pool. Uh, just a comment about it being relocated across the street might limit that use as well. Yeah, um, yeah in terms of the, we, we are anticipating warm-up cool-down spaces. That could be the therapy pool if we make it 75 feet in length so that it could be used with lanes for warm up, cool down, perhaps the kids. But, but to your point, yeah, it all needs to be accessible to the swimming pool to make that work. And I think if I heard you correctly, you thought maybe the children's pool was across the street. What we were saying was there may be a children's play structure across the street. The pool, the children's pool is directly adjacent to our competition pool. Thank you. I did mishear that. Uh, the last one was more of a comment. Uh, in our area, we have extremely high winds and temperatures on occasion that catch a lot of out-of-town engineers off guard. For example, researching shade structures for one of the local schools, many of them were designed for 100-mile-an-hour winds, but it's not uncommon for us to have winds much higher than that uh, they're, you know, they're in our windstorms. Uh, I know that many of the shade structures on base have been damaged because they weren't built to, to high enough, uh, winds. So I just wanted to throw that out there that the winds and temperatures may be a little higher than you're normally used to, uh, engineering for. Well, having done a lot of these down in the Lancaster Palmdale area, I can tell you that they have very similar afternoon breezes. That's what they call them. Uh, it's not uncommon that we have a bucket of rocks outside the kindergarten uh, area, so we put rocks in the kindergarten pocket so they don't blow away. But it, it's definitely a high desert issue, and 100 mile an hour is not uncommon, um, particularly up on the ridges, and you're a little bit higher than Palmdale, Lancaster. I can, I can just, this is Travis Reed, city engineer. I can just say this, I will definitely look at it and it'll be rated to the right wind yeah, loading and the right. We're not gonna miss, we're not gonna all the, miss all the loading will definitely be considered and looked at. And our new dugout shade structures went back to plan to the engineer four times before they got it right. So we definitely will look at that. Definitely. And uh, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? 
No. Okay, thank you, sir. We have another caller. Go ahead. I'm going to just grab some callers on the phone real quick. Is that good? Caller, go ahead. Hi. Yes, my name is Brett, and I have a question um, in regards to the kids' pool area. Will there be any sort of uh, water slides for the youth? That's, that's to be determined. When we come back um, for our next meeting, we're going to be presenting options, and that certainly is going to be one of them to consider. I would say that that in our general conversations, we've been looking to move away from water slides or like the, the three-meter diving board or things that, that create additional cost and maintenance concerns we've been trying to slowly move away from. But I would say the children's pool, we are looking at potentially features that may be able to... Yeah, thank you, yeah. Mr. Mayor. That's, that's a great point, and that is when we do full-on water slides, those are now classified in the state of California as amusement rides. And so they require annual permits, inspections, staffing to that that becomes quite expensive. Now, in the kids' pool, we may be talking about a little three-foot mm -hmm. uh, free willy slide or something yep. that wouldn't fall into that classification, but it might be one of part of the water features for kind of a, a beach entry waiting area. Okay. That's everything I had. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we're going back to questions from the floor. Yeah, I just have a comment about uh, the pool. Uh, you said that one end was going to be like maybe seven, eight feet, eight feet, and one and the other is going to be three and a half. Well, in my experience, three and a half really is not adequate for competition. I get many people that are 18, 19 years old, and they dive off of that place, particularly under relays. It is not a really a really a good idea to make it three and a half feet. So I would like to see something more than like four and a half feet on that end, so that those big kids can dive in, and particularly on relay events. Sure. Sure. And it's much less safer. I don't know about little kids. Three and a half is fine for little kids, but 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 for 19, 18 year olds, that is not. So when we come back, we're going to show you two different options on the pool. The one that I was just describing a moment ago. The three and a half isn't end to end. The three and a half is on the side. So that in, in the case of the, the first six lanes, those are all gonna be at least seven feet deep the entire lane, both ends. So that you could have relays and you can have starting block starts from either end should you choose, especially for the little guys. And then as we go through subsequent lanes, that's where we could get out to the shallow water that allows us to do that. We'll also show in more traditional, as you were describing, if we did it 12 or 7 feet on one end and 3 and a half on the other, we was, clearly it would be posted no diving on that option if that's what we were, you know, looking at. So that would be one of the things we would talk about on, you know, does this or does this not meet your needs. And the walk-in, walk-out area, we have to have that fairly shallow, at that sort of pull-out area as well. Co correct, yes. Yeah, California Code says a public swimming pool has to have a shallow end no deeper than three feet, six inches. So we have to get to a three, six. As Scott mentioned, in some cases, we might do a little foot appendage where it comes out from the pool to meet that requirement. But we'll talk about it from programming, saying how much shallow stuff do we want to have happening? So how much shallow water does that pool really want to have? Will there be an outdoor shower before you get into the pool? Usually they require you to or yeah, ask Yes, you to. there will there'll be a number of outdoor showers. We actually thought about it during the pergola across the, the top there where it comes in from the street, where you have some sort of columns coming down. We might have showers stashed behind those so that either from the competition pool side or the children's pool side, you could wash off there. I've got a question behind you. Oh, yeah comment thank you I have a couple questions and a couple comments um, in the admin building is that where the guard room will be or is that like part of it like a room where the lifeguards can go on breaks and store their stuff okay cool I just wanted to check um, also uh, you guys might have already talked about this but um, is the children's pool like splash pad style or is it like two feet deep it, it'll, it'll have standing water Okay, yeah, because I was just concerned for swim lessons because 
if it's we only had the pool that goes to three and a half feet deep, you would need like little um, inserts so the little kids could touch. Correct. Yeah. So we we envision perhaps a beach entry um, anywhere. There's interactive play features. Um, that has to be in waiting depth, which is roughly 18 inches deep. And then we can decide if we want to get to two, two and a half, or three feet in another zone within that pool. That's something for us to all work together and, and figure out. Yeah, yeah. I just have with experience teaching swim lessons. I sure. was just wondering about that. I, I think we also envision the therapy pool having the ability to be used for small swim children lessons, lessons and training. The, the therapy pool, when you hear therapy, we're not immediately thinking it's only for therapy, but more that it has a different water temperature for children oh, that'll to be do great. lessons. Because I, I have small, four small kids. I know exactly yeah, what you're talking about. Small children about. hate getting Is, in the cold They don't want to get lessons. in the cold water, but if you put them in warm water, they tend to learn more effectively. That'll be good. Um, and then just a couple comments that I agree we should have. You were talking about having possibly an all gender like family bathrooms. I think that it would be a good idea to have for disabled people who need a person of a different gender to help them and just gender non-conforming people in the community. And then my last comment is just, I'm glad this is happening. I've been a lifeguard for years. Um, I worked at Penny Pool the last summer it was open and I do like uh, private life, uh, private swim lessons sometimes in the community and there's just been such a demand for swim lessons. So I'm just glad this is happening because our community has been needing it for a while. Thank you. Thank you, and I think uh, to reiterate, the therapy pool would probably be close to 90 degrees at, at, during, during the course of... It will be designed to be able to go up to that. It's just going to depend on the, the program yeah. of what they're running and yeah. when they're running. We envision that as maybe being, again, perhaps as long as 75 feet, and if that's the case, stairs that would run the entire length of the pool. So that you again, we could have kids or people sitting on you know six inches of water, twelve inches on water, things like that to start learning to blow bubbles and introduction to water and all those things. But it still gives you a length for warm up as well. So Correct. in addition to maybe having a, a practice lane or a, a warm up lane in the main pool, you would still have a place you know because you're, especially if you have a lot of uh, swimmers, one or two lanes is not going to cut it. So. But, but you might have somebody doing aqua jogging and exercising, using it as a gate pool if you're trying to rehab your knees, your ankles, your hips and stuff, and, and without the body mass weight that the water displaces for you. So there's a whole bunch of things we want to try to envision there and then make sure it's set up to support. So speaking of lifeguarding, um, has there been an estimate as to the amount of staffing that this, this facility would require? You want to take that one? Yeah. Um, we haven't yet because we part of it's going to be line of sight and all of that. But one of the things that will come out of this before we're done will be to talk about if we're in full operation, what's it going to take? How many lifeguards would we have to have out there? You know, we might look at this right now from just a um, uh, 30,000 foot level and say the, the main swimming pool would probably require two active lifeguards. You know, we've got a... Um, the therapy pool, that would probably require at least one and the kids one. So now you've got four active lifeguards. Oftentimes you might have a roving lifeguard, so that might be a total of five that you might have at peak season when you're operating the pool. And then we have to talk about part-time to full-time and shifts and breaks and lunch and all that stuff too. And the same goes for overall administration. So do you have a, a, a manager on site, do you have an assistant? How does that work? Custodial, you know, being assigned, you know, for cleaning restrooms and locker rooms. So those are th things I think that still have to come from the city to some extent as to how they think they're going to staff it, and then we adjust the spaces to accommodate that. So uh, if you take the lifeguard area, we need to have a separate place for them to change, possibly that is different from the community areas. Um, a place where they can take a break, uh, a break room maybe in general for all the staff that might be there. Uh, those are the things that we still need to kind of build into this process. A first aid area as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, let me go on and ask if there's any members of the uh, committee that have any other questions or comments. Uh, may sound like I'm not going to have a lot, but that's because 
I'm talking to these gentlemen more regularly than, you know, and so I've, I know if I've had a question that's been answered already from Dennis or Scott. Is there any member of the, the commission or the committee that has any other questions? Comments? Um, I do. ADA access contrivance from the deck into the water. I, I have a vague idea what that device looks like. Would there be one for each of the three pools? The, um, well, there, there has to be ADA accessibility compliant for each of the pools, yes. And most likely there will be one for each of the pools. The only hesitancy I have is the children's pool. Um, the, you have to be able to get the top of, a, of the seat at least 18 inches below water so that the body becomes buoyant. And if you have the foot well as, as well, it's going to depend on how deep that children's pool actually gets. Is it deep enough for the lift, or is it going to be a ramp entry a that may, meets the ADA? In. A simple slope in. Um, if we went to a three-foot depth, for example, then yes, we would have a lift as part of that. I understand. My friend, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So next steps. Next steps. You want to go ahead and... So we anticipate that we'll be back here at about one month's time for your next meeting. We'll get that on the schedule. And the deliverables at that time will be much more defined. Uh, floor plan, building plans, pool plans, much delivered in the same format that we're talking about now. Starting to put first estimates together. We have a rough idea at this point, but we wanted this feedback tonight to make sure we were on point. And then that will be the kickoff after that meeting to move into the construction documents that will lead us to the review for wind <laughs> as well as getting things ready and permitted and also thinking about how we're going to ultimately deliver this in terms of the construction process. So there's a couple other things we'll ask. We'll probably reach out based on what we have tonight and work with the city to get a uh, geotechnical report done, soils, borings for the pool and the buildings. That'll take probably a month and a half or so, and we'll need that for the construction documents. So we want to be back here in about 30 days with more to show. Okay. I did have a question just for the audience. That, that you just said my mind as he was talking about our timelines, and we've made a commitment as a council that we're moving forward with this. You guys are seeing the action. I'm just curious, is there anything that you saw today that you said we missed? Is there something that we missed? Okay. Just want to make sure. You guys are here. Thank you for participating. We ask our citizens to come out and give us the feedback. Let us know what we're doing. We're moving along. Obviously, we're moving quickly. Uh, again, our goal is to have this open by spring of 2025. We're all aboard on that, that goal, and, and, and so... That's our hopes, and I appreciate everyone's you know, feedback. And again, if you should have any other questions, comments, you have a thought, feel free to email any member of the council, any member of the committee. We're all here to listen. OK? Is, there, is the design going to include landscaping plans? I believe it is, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So landscaping, civil engineering, structural yeah. engineering, mechanical, electrical, all the aquatic design, that is all. It's, That'll it's all a, come back. A, and construction administration, yeah, I see the oversight on behalf of the city. And I apologize. We got one more caller that called in, so I'm, I'm happy to take anybody. Any other caller? Go ahead. Oh, yes. This is Ashley Gardner. I'm the mom of soon-to-be two kids in Ridgecrest, and you were talking about the splash pad earlier. I wanted to know if the expansion of the splash pad is just going to be a playground or if you're also going to be expanding the water park as well. We're looking at both. Uh, they are budget contingent, um, but the current plan is to possibly do some additional water features in order to allow us to fix some of the drainage concerns around the splash pad. Um, we're well aware of them, and if we're going to start tearing into piping and that, we might be putting in some additional features at the same time because it's more cost effective. So technically, both are, are on the table. Um, one of the big challenges is we need to get this project designed and in motion before we go and start working on the ones that we can work on 
in-house, and we've got two or three. This project and the Clean California project are, um, these are, I mean, between the two projects, you're talking, you know, between 16 and $20 million of investment by the community. So those two projects are taking the bulk of priority with the Freedom Park improvements of the splash pad and the playgrounds. They are, they are kind of in the um, being talked about while we're driving force on this right now. So the answer is, I hope to say both. Okay, thank you. Because as a parent of young children, the splash pad is a resource. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I thank you for saying that. That was one of the things that I, I, I've been amazed at, uh, even myself. I, like I said, I was one of the uh, vocal, I was vocally opposed to the splash pad. Uh, and I will tell you, my opinion has changed over time just in seeing what its value has been. Yes. But I just wanted to let everyone know that it is appreciated by the families in town that have young children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I think we've had, heard from everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. We are not going to do any other business this evening but this. Um, I don't think we're going to – are we – Nurse, did you intend to present any reports? No. Okay. Then we will go ahead and adjourn our meeting at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and we'll let you know when their next one's happening. <laughs>